Well, hello everyone. This is Betty Meredith, president of the Retirement Resource Center, a retirement education and training company for financial professionals, their clients, and consumers. And I'm happy to be here with you today for this webinar, Bonds Away, How Fixed Income Can Play an Integral Role in Any Retirement Strategy with Russell Wild, MBA and Principal of Global Portfolios. Unlike stocks, which date back only several hundred years, bonds go back many thousands. And the first bond was issued around 1200, 2400 BC in Nippur, Mesopotamia, which is part of Iraq. And arguably all these years and into the present day, bonds have been a retiree's best friend. Bond income generates income for sure, but they offer retirees more than that. They offer security. And thanks to bonds, your grandparents and possibly great grandparents may have been spared from selling apples on the street during the Great Depression. But bond investing is tricky, and most investment advisors agree that it can be more complex and difficult than investing in stocks. Bonds come in many flavors and colors. There are government bonds, corporate bonds, munis, bonds of high quality, junk bonds, long-term bonds, short-term individual bonds, and thousands of bond mutual and exchange traded funds. So how to choose? This webinar will prepare and present the essentials for building the fixed income side of a retiree's portfolio. And Russell Wild, MBA, is the author of Bond Investing for Dummies, now in its third edition. Exchange Traded Funds for Dummies is also in its third edition and numerous other books on finance. He has written for dozens of publications, often covering the finer points of bond investing. And Russell is the principal of Global Portfolios, a fee-only investment advisory firm based in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. So Russell, thank you for being here with us today. And I'll turn my webcam off and we'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Betty. And thank you everyone for coming today. I love talking about bonds, as, as Betty alluded to. They, they seem so simple on the face of things, but when you delve in, they're just deliciously complex. And I, the only thing I can, I can relay it to is writing a novel, perhaps a children's book. It just looks so easy, but when you try to do it, so today we're going to cover uh, understanding the major role that bonds should play in a retirement portfolio. We're going to look at what kinds of bonds belong in a retiree's account and what kind of bonds do not. We're going to look at individual bonds, bond ladders, bond mutual funds, and fixed income ETFs. How do you decide which to invest in? We're going to discover the real risk of bonds that most overplay, and we'll look at a risk or two that are overplayed as well as underplayed. Uh, and we're going to look at uh, the key to successful bond trading in case you choose to invest in individual bonds. When I wrote Bond Investing for Dummies, my daughter who turns 27 today uh, was then a teenager and I asked her to draw a picture of two Mesopotamian, oh, excuse me, Babylonian, uh, a, a borrower and a lender. Uh, I have a wonderful book here, um, The History of Interest Rates, published by Wiley. It's a monster, but a fascinating read. And the authors dug up uh, documents from thousands of years ago that talk about lenders and borrowers and interest. And a bond is really an IOU. It's a legally sanctioned IOU. And in a story told by the author, uh, we're going back now um, about 250 BC. And the guy on the left there, that's Nabu Usabi. Yes, that was a real, a real borrower back in uh, back in ancient Babylonia. And the guy on the right is Nab Sar Aseshu. And Nabsar Aseshu um, borrowed a half mina of silver. That was about, uh, about a half a pound. And in front of a holy priest and three countrymen, they drew up an agreement that the half mina of silver would be paid within a year, along with 10 shekels. And that was the interest. And if you're wondering what a shekel looks like, I'm going to get the hang of this. There we go. That's what a shekel looks like. But bonds actually predate money. If we go back 1,500, 2,000 years before that to ancient Mesopotamia, if any of you read cuneiform, you might recognize on this tablet a buyer, uh, a borrower, a lender, 
and some interest and a time period and some grain because back then there were no coins yet and the most common form of exchange was grain. If you're wondering what the interest rate rates were, it depended on the commodity. Uh, we're, we're talking about thousands of years ago in the before the common era. Interest rates tended to bounce between 20 and 50 percent. Uh, they tended it tended to depend. Uh, just like today, interest rates went went up and down. Although by today's standards, they were always up, and. Uh, it depended on the commodity. There was generally a much higher interest rate on grain, perhaps because of spoilage, than there was on, on precious metals. And then we're talking about the 1100s. Bonds started to take on a form that we're more familiar with. They were issued as certificates. Uh, started about 1100 in Venice, because Venice was a, a city-state raging war against other city-states on the Italian peninsula, and they issued something called a prestiti. It was a certificate that offered citizens uh, the option of lending money to the state, and then they would get a certain uh, amount of interest, and by then interest rates were more like 15 20%, a certain amount of interest. There was no maturity date by then. The, uh, the interest would be paid forever, as long as you held the bond. Um, this bond here on, on the slide is issued by the Imperial Chinese government. The date is too small to read, but it was probably late 1800s, early 1900s, and this one was issued in British pounds. On the right, you can see uh, in the old days, not very old days, because these bonds stayed in this form until 1982, We'll talk about that in a moment. These bonds had coupons, and the coupons were cut out, and they were turned into the issuer of the bond, and whatever the interest rate was, if it was 5% on a 100-pound note, you would get uh, you would get five pounds a year. And usually these coupons were good every six months. You cut it out, you turn it into the Chinese government in this case, and you'd get two and a half uh, pounds uh, per six months. Um, in, um, oh, let me just show you. I, I have one up on my wall, another, another example. The coupons are actually on the back, but this is one from the New York Central Railroad Company. It was issued in 1955. It matured in 1980. I just, they're beautiful works of art. I'm sorry they went by the wayside, but the U.S. government isn't because in 1982 they figured there were too many people not paying taxes on there on their bond interest. So then we move to electronic form. Um, and ever since 1982, if you want to hold bonds, you get them through a bank, through a brokerage, and uh, they will be held for you electronically. You get a statement once a month, once every six months, just like you do for holding stocks. This particular statement is from the US Treasury. Uh, you can own treasury bonds directly through the treasury, and this is a statement attesting that uh, whoever uh, whoever statement this is has $30,000 in U.S. treasuries. I should say the one exception, interestingly enough, where you can actually get a certificate bond today is U.S. savings bonds, but only those savings bonds that are purchased with tax refunds up to 5000 a year. Go figure. The regular uh, savings bonds and, and other uh, treasuries do not offer certificates anymore. Mm -hmm.